One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, coming tonight. Um, um, also on behalf of uh, Music Pool Berlin. Um, maybe um, just um, some quick introduction, what we try to do. And actually, I think we achieved actually pretty a lot today. Um, so we had this um, trial and error space um, um, curated as my, my colleague Andrea and, and myself. Um, we started very early today um, um, here up here in the stage six and in our um, little um, workshop room where we all gonna go later on. So please um, keep in mind we have drinks downstairs. So um, we have a little get together afterwards. So don't run away um, to the beach, but come with us. And um, yeah, so we started the day um, um, talking a little bit about um, narratives of the Web3, um, then um, developed um, the, the whole story, um, got um, deeper into um, um, some more specific aspects, how, for instance, um, Web3, um, let's say, ideas and concepts um, might change how um, cultural um, production and also um, structures um, of production might uh, be changed. Um, then um, um, also moved on, uh, talked about um, values of art, um, also in the context of this um, um, whole Web3 um, context. And um, also had a, a lot of um, workshops going on during the day. Um, for instance, we asked about, um, is there also like feminism in Web3? So we had no idea, but um, obviously um, we had um, this really cool workshop from um, Katrin Fritsch. Um, um, we will also present some of the results um, in the following days. And now, um, like at the very um, um, end of this um, Web3 day of our um, trial and error space, um, we're here now. And um, what we want to do is, um, yeah, we want to dream up a, a Web3 for music tonight. So um, no limits, <laughs> no... Um, Let's say um, everything is um, possible. We are very positive, um, and uh, we allow ourselves to um, really, um, yeah, start dreaming. And let me quickly um, uh, introduce you about um, um, the idea that I had um, about this panel. Um, so, what if the Web three, um, with its um, automized decision making processes and direct distribution and monetization channels, could offer a real alternative um, to the current Internet of rather monopolistic platforms and uh, data silos. Um, we also, uh, during the uh, preparations for this trial and error space, I, I, I also had like this, this idea, I had a, a cooperative in mind, like a, in German, a Genossenschaft, um, um, where music producers work with curators, formerly known as um, journalists, and uh, technological enablers, um, like Matt, for instance, um, for music publishing and distribution. And um, yeah, and, and therefore, we, we would, I would like to ask what would work uh, on protocols f uh, of the Web3, namely DAOs, tokens, NFTs. So there's something we just want to um, dive in now. And um, <clears throat> what I'd also love to discuss, or at least um, not forget about, is obviously... Um, like this, this big um, sustainability question, like is this um, blockchain technology fundamental uh, to, to all these dreams? Um, um, or is this uh, technology that is originally um, conceived for financial transactions without a middleman um, simply opening up a, a sphere uh, to fundamentally uh, re rethink um, our economic practices, um, to reorganize ourselves economically, politically, and maybe also um, as a society? Um, yeah, but let's see um, where these dreams are going tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce um, uh, my guests, um, starting with um, uh, Caitlin Davis. Hi, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin is a um, Lisbon-based Canadian. Uh, I got this from your profile. Um, <laughs> where she works and collaborates in music and technology, right? Um, very interesting. Um, you are um, already um, um, working on um, some of the working on some of the ideas I'd like to discuss today or dream about, um, namely um, um, the, um, the uh, Refraction um, uh, Festival. And uh, furthermore, you're also like a um, host of radio shows um, um, on Refugee Worldwide and Kashmir Radio, right? And then we got um, Matt here, uh, Matt Dryhurst. Um, he's actually 
I'd say he's an, he's an artist, right? Um, and, and also um, um, and a researcher. Um, you're based in Berlin. Um, your research focuses on, on technical and um, ethical uh, protocols um, to be discussed later on in the course of um, the discussion. Um, and you make music and create art with um, Holly Hearn. Um, many of you um, know her. Um, she's um, like... Um, Yeah, very outstanding um, um, artist if it comes to new technologies. Uh, at least that's how, uh, how I uh, read her in the past. Um, we just talked about um, it earlier. Um, you also used to be a lecturer at NYU. So um, maybe also something we can talk about later. And um, uh, you um, host um, the Interdependence. Um, is it like a podcast, right? It's a podcast. It's a podcast, <laughs> yeah. Um, talking about podcasts, there we have um, uh, also Marcel Weiss. Um, um, we know each other um, for quite a long time, um, back from the days when um, the music industry um, was whining that the internet destroys the music industry. Ha ha ha! Um, so um, quite some some years ago that we uh, talked about that. Um, uh, Marcel is an economist, right? Yeah. Um, um, your focus of work is the um, anal analysis of um, platform economy, and um, um, you also paid. Um, like a lot of attention to um, the so-called creator economy. Maybe also helpful if we talk um, about structures um, tonight. Um, and you um, also host and producer of the um, Neunetz um, podcast. So um, very uh, great to have you here uh, tonight. Um, let, me, let us um, jump into our dreaming session um, right away. Um, um, Caitlin, um, reading through what you guys are doing uh, with your Refraction Festival. Um, maybe we don't need to dream anymore, but but simply join your collective? <laughs> yeah, Refraction has been a really like amazing experiment. It started as a... It kind of came together long before I was part of it as a kind of pandemic project in early... The first festival was, I think... 2020, early 2021, um, and it was this real pairing of like music and visual artists, um, and I just remember seeing the programming and being really impressed and thinking it like looked really great. And then at the end, towards the end of 2021, they uh, launched as a DAO. Um, they went through this program called Seed Club, which like kind of helps uh, organizations explore how they can. Uh, tokenize, uh, I guess is the easiest way to explain what Seed Club is. And I just saw a lot of people who I was really um, inspired by, interested in, share the sort of like uh, welcome world post. Um, and I went in the Discord and just kind of started chatting to people. And a huge part of the crew is from Canada. So we realized we like, you know, knew all the same people as it goes in music. Um, and then we started... Basically, the vision was to decentralize the the sort of online version of the festival. Um, we didn't know, I mean, we started our planning in, in January of this year when really everything was so certain. And, you know, in New York, everything was open. Here, everything was closed. In Canada, everything was even more closed. Um, so it was really interesting to kind of deal with partners. We were working with people like in, in Tokyo, in Montreal, in Vancouver, in New York, you know, kind of everywhere. And you really see how, how like, effective but challenging decentralization can be. Um, but yeah, I guess we're kind of rounding out the first iteration of our festival um, where we've done in-person events in New York, Toronto, Berlin, We just did one in Sao Paulo this weekend that looked really, really amazing. Um, yeah, I was not there. Um, and then we're doing a big, uh, some big events at NFT NYC, um, and there's going to be like a metaverse component to it. Anyway, it's just very cool to see people like kind of organize in this decentralized way. And now we have, uh, you know, some interesting tooling in by by way of like tokens that allow us to like govern and organize. Yeah, um, I also um, <clears throat> read a bit, a little bit about um, the Refraction uh, Collective. So, if you say um, festival, um, you're actually you're not just talking about like um, gatherings, but 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 rather like um, also like um, um, 
stable structures. Um, so uh, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit? Because I, I like this idea a lot. Yeah, so like Refraction DAO is the like organization and the festival is kind of, Refraction Festival is like our cornerstone a project, I guess. We wanted to kind of blow up the idea of what people thought a music festival was. I think people, you know, traditionally think you go to a field for three days and drink lots of beer and hear lots of music and, um, or, or sort of some iteration of that. And uh, we wanted to kind of think about like, what does it mean for a festival to last five months? What does it mean to have events, you know, kind of uh, sporadically happen in different places, both online, in person, um, and sort of how how can we, like, what what's the through line there? Um, and I, I think that's what we're trying to figure out still, but it's been it's been really interesting. And, and, and coming back to, to my dream about, like, this um, cooperative where everybody, like, um, a group of uh, musicians and um, technical enablers and um, other people who know a lot about, like, distribution, for instance, uh, work together. So how far away is it actually from, from, from what I described? I mean, not that far away, I guess. I mean, I think right now we are not really... We're doing like visual NFT drops in terms, if, if you think about like the, the distribution of art um, and we're going, we're launching like an editorial platform, but our, our aims at least right now are not to like, it's not like to become a label and distribute music in the sort of traditional way. So many, uh, how many people are involved in the um, Reflection Collective? Our sort of, I guess our core, we like organize ourselves in guilds and in the core guilds, there's probably 25 or 30 of us and then wider i think we have about 1500 members now um so these are these are artists but but also other stakeholders of the let's say ecosystem exactly so it's like visual artists music artists but then also this idea of like cultural maintainers like i don't identify as an artist but i'm very much like a member of refraction so we welcome like um journalists curators there's kind of a wide mix of people and the technical side is also represented in the collective yeah so the team behind refraction also worked on this app that still exists many years ago called generate it's like a a, a photo editing app so there's like a crew like the a lot of the core team are also developers okay so since um we are dreaming <clears throat> so it's not it's of course not all about money right um so so what are the benefits um um Are there also non-material benefits that you see in this um, whole, I mean, um, setup? I think it's interesting because people can contribute to, you know, we did this big uh, NFT drop, this uh, like essentially like, uh, like a fundraising. And, but we were able to kind of uh, distribute the funds from that to people in Sao Paulo who had nothing to do specifically with the drop, but the, it, it was sort of this like collective means of uh, like fundraising and distribution. So, I mean, that's the, the financial side of it. I think the like non-financial side of it is like, it's just in human nature to like identify with a community. And it's kind of amazing. It, I mean, it's amazing for me now. I can go uh, to so many, I could go to Sao Paulo and have a couch to stay on. To me, that's way more valuable than any sort of like monetary aspect of it. Um, And, and since DAO um, already um, 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 appeared in, in, in the discussion, um, so um, how, how, how um, do you organize like participation? How are decisions made? Maybe something um, you can like um, um, elaborate how, how this actually works. Like how does a DAO work like in, in, in practice? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously super difficult. Like we have these, we have tools, but like humans are still humans and decision making is hard. It's especially hard when people's like artistic taste comes into it because what you might find interesting is very different what I might find interesting but we could still be organizing around a similar goal I think with refraction we're quite lucky in that like it feels like a lot of the stuff that we do is very very purpose driven and a lot of people who are interested in it kind of come in because they already appreciate the like visual or musical style so it, we we actually haven't had many issues curatorial and curatorially in terms of being like I don't want to book that artist and somebody really like we we're kind of all on the same page about stuff like that but yeah of, of course it's hard to to make decisions when you're a group of like people distributed across the world um the the 
I mean, I'm probably not the best person to talk about it. You can probably talk about it better, but about like uh, For instance, economics and like governance and stuff. Uh, on, a, on a very practical side, like uh, if it comes to decision making, so so how can I imagine like, a, for instance, a voting process? Is it it's, is it um, mostly um, uh, automized, or would you say since you also have like this this, this physical physical meetings and you you talk to each other, you know each other? So what's 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 the what's the importance of of like the the Uh, automization side of things that would be interested uh, would be interested in well i think when you remove like hi traditional sort of like triangle pyramid hierarchies you have to introduce some sort of governance layer to make decisions and people are very scared of this word governance they're like i'm a music label why do i need to why do, why do we need to vote on anything um but i think that that's where things get really interesting um there's a tool that most DAOs use called snapshot which allows you to I mean, I won't get too into it, but it allows you to kind of do a weighted vote depending on how many tokens you own um, increases the kind of weight of your vote. Um, but it's like, it's actually technically not on-chain voting, but it, 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 it sort of like interacts with the blockchain. But then also like, I mean, so many DAOs are oriented around Discord, which is kind of, um, I, heard, I heard Slack Discord like described as boomer discord recently <laughs> so think about that like the opposite way um uh, like sometimes discord is just like hey do we want to rename this channel like red emoji for no green emoji for yes it's like that easy i think and like that is actually a governance tool that i think for for me i've noticed that like language is kind of everything and some people like immediately shut down or get very defensive when you use the word governance, but it is just decision making. All right. Um, talking about like, um, so you, you said like the um, uh, collective basically grows, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, but I was just thinking, are there, are there any limits that you have in mind? I mean, is it, is it all about scaling again? Or um, would you say, um, so would you say the more people become part of the collective, the greater the market power, whatever, um, the higher the profits for the individual members or stakeholders of the collective? Is this like the way to go or are there other ideas <laughs> involved? It's difficult. I saw somebody say online, they said something along the lines of like the issue that a lot of DAOs are going to run into is that they are onboarding everybody who's interested in a way that like you can't hire everybody who applies for a job in a, you know, even in a startup. But I guess, how have you been doing it with like Holly Plus, like in the DAO? Yeah, we took, we took kind of the opposite approach. So I'm, I'm a member of quite a few DAOs. Um, but one that I helped incept is with my partner, Holly. And it's basically like a, it's a, it's a DAO where it's invite only. Um, the people who are invited are given uh, a governance right over the appropriate usage of her digital likeness, which can get very complicated and we could talk mm. too long about that. But long story short, it's quite the opposite approach to a lot of DAOs, like particularly over the past couple of years. As the word has become buzzy, which is, in my sense, not a pejorative thing, it's just something that happens when new technology, more people hear about it. Um, there is this temptation with the Discord to be like, let everyone in, and then yeah. go speak to a VC and be like, we've got 20,000 people who yeah. you can't verify they're actually humans. And oftentimes, like, um, we took the opposite approach because what we're trying to incubate is actually very precious, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, the idea with the Holly Plus DAO, at least, is that you want people to be incentivized to effectively govern the mm -hmm. digital likeness, and they don't want it to be inappropriately used. And I would say with Refraction, there's probably also a shared sentiment there. You've got a lot of people with Refraction who are coming from deep cultures. What I love about Refraction in particular is this is a festival that existed beforehand. This mm -hmm. was a community festival that was looking for new ways to bring people in to support the artists and to build and to grow the profile of what they're doing. But of course, you can love it. You can like break it. Mm -hmm. If you'd invite in 100,000 people randomly and say, one day you're going to get an airdrop of something, right? That could just break the whole point of it. And so yeah. it's a fine balance. Um, yeah. And I've seen, I've seen every example. I, I know of DAOs that are like, four people that yeah, you're yeah. never going to get access to and you probably don't know exist, and then DAOs of like, DAOs, discords, <laughs> of, of huge amounts of people that don't really do anything effectively other than maybe present the illusion of scale. Okay, quick poll. Um, anybody uh, in the audience um, is a member of a DAO? Uh, hey. <laughs> 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 Oops. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, so maybe it's uh, worth uh, digging a bit uh, deeper in, into the um, um, whole idea of DAOs. Um, but um, I think what, one important takeaway for me, because um, um, I also uh, thought a lot about um, no, about this um, cooperatives in German Genossenschaften, because th then you usually come to this point, so who should be entitled to be part of this Genossenschaft or co-op? And I think it's a, it's a very uh, crucial um, um, aspect of who, who do you want to deal with um, um, within your collective, for instance. I think this is a um, um, super interesting aspect. So, But there's not a, like a hard, let's say, regula regulatory framework for who, will, who is um, uh, allowed to join. Not with refraction and like not at this time, but I'm, I'm part of another DAO that's like quite a lot bigger called Friends with Benefits. And we have, uh, like a membership layer where you have to like apply and, uh, be, be voted in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I want to bring, uh, Marcel into, um, the conversation. Um, so if you want to, um, overcome the uh, web 2.0, uh, which is based on scaling and growth. Basically, because <laughs> um, that's the the promise of platforms um, like Spotify, YouTube, uh, etc. Um, do creators need to become more selective and uh, collaborate only with stakeholders who who share their values? Or how? What could be like an approach? Um, I'm I'm also um, referring to your um, ideas about um, creator economy. So is it all about um, growth and scaling, or are there other um, concepts um, um, that you want to advocate? <laughs> well, I think first is what, what, we, what we have to, to look at, at the world as, as it is right now mm -hmm. with platforms like Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. When you're a creator, when you're an influencer, you're, you're very prominent, and, and, but, but, but it doesn't mean that... And you, you will create a lot of value for, well, for Instagram or for YouTube, but it doesn't mean they're, they're not paying you. I mean, with YouTube, there's a share when, when you have ads. With Instagram, there's nothing. Um, when, when you're not part of a, of a program you know, for, for pushing up reels or something like that. So you're creating a lot of value for a platform and it's, it's like the biggest, wealthiest companies in the world. And, and you as a creator, very, you're very small, you have just a few thousand followers or, or whatever, or, or millions. You, you're, not getting, you're not getting paid to that. And it's like, it just grew like that over the last 10 years. And it's, uh, in a lot of ways, I think, People just accepted it, and, and over the last years, a lot of people, uh, I think, woke up that that's not how it's uh, how it uh, should be. So there's a lot of talk about how we can change that, how creators can be can be stakeholders in the, in the platforms that, that we're creating value for. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm uh, looking at a lot of creator economy. It's mainly because we know each other for like more than ten years. So I've been. Uh, doing a lot of work in copyright and, and, and music industry and so on, and I've always been thinking about how creator creatives are making can make money online, and and then this uh, creative economy idea came came about, and and uh, it's, it was interesting to to see over the last two years. I'm following a lot of experts or, or a lot of people who are talking about it, about creator economy, and all of a sudden, like everyone who is who is. Uh, looking at creators and how I can make money, everyone started talking about crypto and, and, and Web3 and NFTs and so on. Yeah, that would be my question. Is, is this like the, the, the game changer now for this? Uh, or is this an alternative to, to the scaling and growth that you probably have um, other products that don't necessarily have to scale that much? I've, well, I've, I, think, I think it is. Uh, uh, in a lot of ways, you're, you're building a new information architectures with different structures for, for stakeholders. Like, Look at the last 15 years, what, what, what emerged on the web. Like, we, we got innovative products, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, it's all innovative products, but behind them, there are traditional companies, which are just uh, with, with shareholders who, who just, who are, the organizations behind them are just like we, we knew them like 100 years before. And I think what we are now seeing is for the first time that we're getting tools to also build new organizations behind these products, these platforms, these worlds where we're creators uh, making stuff for us, where we're all uh, getting getting together. And um, the, it's, I mean, that's, it's a cliche to say, but we're still in the early days. I, I, I have an organizational theory, theory uh, background, and 
experimentation and organization is like the hardest thing humans can do. And, and, and with DAOs, I think we're, we're going to see some, some really big failures like, like trains who are just, like, like, like you say, just getting, getting too big and nobody can stop it and, and it was good and, and, it's, and it's crashing because we have uh, to learn a lot of things. And it's also interesting to see a lot of people who are building DAOs don't have an organization of fear, theoretical uh, background. And it's like people, <laughs> a, a year ago, I, I, was, I was laughing to myself at seeing people uh, 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 re, 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 uh, finding for themselves, oh, division of labor, we can do pots different in, in DAOs. And so so uh, uh, it's very, very interesting to see that, uh, that this sometimes we're starting very at, at the very basics and, and building this all up and... Yeah, it's it's going to take time. A lot of st stuff will fail, but um, it's for the first time I see as someone who's studying platforms and platform economics. Um, platforms are about capturing network effects, and these network effects are natural to to some markets like social media, like like people connecting, and um, you can't regulate that away. You can't break up Facebook, but the parts that you break up are just going to get at the same scale because the network effects are still there. So for the first time, well, what I see, what, what we can do, what we can build a world where it's not about monopolies is based on, on protocols like the blockchains, NFTs, and so on. Um, another interesting aspect, um, um, and this is um, going uh, into your direction, Matt. Um, so... Um, Self-hosting and controlling materials, because we talked about like this way back project <laughs> earlier when we when we met uh, downstairs. Um, so you once described the core dilemma for creators uh, such as uh, music producers um, as follows: publishing information or music through a centralized third party and loss of control over that work after it has been published, and what the publishers or platforms like Spotify, YouTube, etc., um, end up doing with it. Right. Um, so. Um, is self-hosting and uh, controlling uh, your material, your music in this case, um, um, after it has been published, a way out of um, like this dilemma um, that, that the platforms uh, basically describe? Um, um, what has the Web3 to offer um, uh, to this regard? Yeah, I mean, the project you're referring to is a bit of my biography. Like Around 2013, 2014, I started get, getting interested in this thing, platform cooperativism, which kind of precedes a lot of these conversations where the basic idea was, we're all on Twitter, Twitter has an ad model, we perform labor on Twitter, Twitter's company valuation number go up, we don't see any of that, right? There's no monetization there, except we're all being monetized in some way. So the basic assertion around 2013, 2014 was like, well, what if we owned a piece of Twitter? Could we, Twitter's not that complicated. Like, could you just make a Twitter? And then we all own a part of it. Um, from there, I built a thing called Saga. This was in 2014, released about 2015, thinking about what, would it, what, what it would mean to basically give creators, artists, a dashboard that gave them control, discrete control of their work all over the internet. Um, and to do that, I was like, oh, it'd be really cool if you could write rules, like rules for your artwork to exist. And your artwork would change in accordance with these so, rules. So smart contracts. Yes, yeah, thank you. So I learned about what a smart contract was. Um, yeah, and so from then, I've been very involved in crypto because um, this was around about the time that Ethereum was beginning as an organization and they were the ones thinking about smart contracts, right? So for those who don't know, you know, the difference between the Ethereum ecosystem and, say, Bitcoin is the idea that you, know, you, have, you have a ledger and Bitcoin's kind of like a financial money ledger. Ethereum's like Excel. Right? Ethereum is like Excel, you can put programs in there to do stuff. I send you one Ether and it gets divided equally between everyone in this room automatically. Right? That's a smart contract. So for me, the, the big principle, like at least when thinking about Spotify, I've definitely thrown so much fruit at Spotify over 10 years, um, is just this idea of the, the kind of core absurdity of a one-size-fits-all creator model. I can concede that uh, in a more naive time of the internet, uh, when everyone's panicking, that people would all agree on one particular thing. So let's look at like the absurdity of that, right? So every creator across Earth is to have their music, is to give their music away for free to one company, right? So that everybody can enjoy it for free and everybody accepts a universal uh, per stream payout, right? So what is also the, the, the kind of one size fits all, a part of that, is just the, the basic observation that nobody ever criticizes that the best way to value music ultimately is the amount of times you play it, 
right? That's almost, it's so fundamental to the streaming economy and allegedly fixing music, which I've heard for 10 years, um, that, that it almost goes and, and, and looked at, right? That naturally, okay, the future is that you'll just get paid the amount of time someone plays something. Now, of course, you know, if you're a fan of Tarkovsky or you're a fan of great literature, right? You don't read the book 100,000 times, right? Um, so, so it kind of falls a bit flat. It works really, really well for a scale model, and it works really, really well, turns out, for the majors that ultimately kind of puppeteer Spotify for reasons that are kind of outside Spotify's control, but let's just say that's true. So the thing for me is you've got this one-size-fits-all model of Web2 that works really well for some people and works kind of diminishing returns for everybody else. With crypto, which has then gone on to be described as Web3, I still like using the term crypto because I think Web3 has also kind of lost a lot of its meaning recently. Um, this idea of saying, okay, well, you have a core infrastructure of an open permissionless database in which there are tokens that allow for you to build structures where you can transfer ownership of these kind of shared dream projects between people. But fundamentally, it's the idea that you as an artist or an organization can be the tailor of your own economy. So you're not wearing a suit that one person in Stockholm came up with randomly who had no experience of music industry prior, let us just say. Instead, you have a suite of tools available to you to be able to build an economy that fits you. Um, and why I'm kind of very encouraged at the moment, even though I loathe, there's definitely moments where I look and be like, what have we done? Uh, but I, there's corners of crypto I don't like. Um, that being said, in corners of crypto I do like, you are now seeing, I would argue, a, a clip of like two or three new ideas, new configurations weekly. Now, coming from a 2015 conversation of making arguments against Spotify and ultimately falling short because there were no other competing narratives, there was nothing else going on, you're seeing experiments happen at a clip of two or three a week. Um, and if I, the things that I talk about that I'm excited about invariably are things that have happened in the last two weeks, right? So irrespective of like the long-term feasibility of any one of those projects, ultimately the dream is kind of realized, at least from my, my criteria of, of being critical of Web2, is that now we're in a scenario where we're seeing thousands and thousands of people coming to here and saying, what would an economy for my scene, my city, my very small context, my very large context, what would that look like? On top of that, another principle of crypto is this idea that it's all open and available, right? So I'll give an example. Uh, people on this room might be, one of my favorite projects at the moment is called Song Camp. Song Camp is described as a headless band. What does that mean? A headless band, uh, there's a group called Other Internet, they called Bitcoin the first headless brand. Why is it a headless brand? Nobody really owns or controls Bitcoin, no one individual does, right? But all together, everybody has a shared interest, if you hold Bitcoin or whatever, to create this kind of brand. You're seeing decentralized branding occur. A headless band is more or less the same. What does it mean to be in a band with a thousand people um, and share the profits made from your collective work together? Now, SongCamp did that. They started, I think it's like 80 or something people. Um, what's really cool about that is that when they experiment uh, uh, with it on an open blockchain, if you and your community, we're one step away, we're one actually company, if anyone wants to start this company away from making this clickable, um, but we're one step away from you being like, huh, what they did seems really cool. Click, fork, I wanna do that too. I wanna try that model over here. So we've gone from a scenario where everyone's accepting one universal model invented by someone with no experience in the music industry from Stockholm, who have had some successes, don't, I don't wanna dis disregard that, to a potential scenario in the next five years of being able to look at thousands of different recipes that you could experiment with per release or per organization or per whatnot. Now that to me is a very dream-like scenario. There will be in immense failures as there have been throughout the history of crypto, but that's progress in my mind. So how... Uh, I think, that's, I think that's, a, that's a very important aspect, uh, the aspect of what people call composability. So we, so we get... A, get a, a large variety that we right now can't even fathom what we're going to get because we now have like a handful of stuff that, that's like for everyone. Totally. You know, I mean, to, to, to quote SD Sound System, uh, I was there in 2005 when the first Web 2 APIs came out. And I was there when, 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 when we were the, over the years talk about like, like all these APIs would, would, would uh, 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 allow an interconnected world of, of, of data portability and, and servers would talk to each other. And I was there in 2008, 9 when, when a lot of stuff was built on top of the Twitter API. And then I was there in 2012 around when Twitter shut down its API and it, and it just all that was built on top just went away. And what we're getting now with, for example, NFTs is a building block for an ecosystem that can be 
put together like like, like Lego, like 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 toys. But you, you just say, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I do it together. And for example, especially for music, where, where, where there's a lot of collaboration between artists, there's so much potential here, where you can say. Uh, for example, I'm I'm a big artist, and I see an upcoming artist, and when 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 I know my fans and and her fans are have all uh, NFTs in their wallets, and I know I have like I have like my own fan club or or, or whatever, I can say I want to support her. Uh, how, how can I do it? I can I just click here, and everyone who who has NFTs from from this artist. I don't know. Get get access to my fan club or get this, get, get some this this is some benefits from me, so I can so I can so I can pull her up. Just this one example, and it says, and right now that's not possible. Mm -hmm. So now I, I can't I can't just look at at, at a band or artist that I want to support and can just I do this this. I have to talk to her. Maybe we're using the same service like I, and maybe the service has this has this feature for collaboration, or maybe it does not. So the question is, do we want a music world? Where everything that's, that's possible is decided by some product manager at Spotify, or, or something that, that just get built by people around the world, that just has building blocks, and we can just connect them as, as, as we see fit. Also, kind of like one on from that, I think this is something that's like actually quite underexplored right now, but like if each one of us made music and like released it on the blockchain as NFTs and one person in this room had all four of our NFTs in their wallet, we could see that in a way that we couldn't, we wouldn't know that that person had all of our songs on, on like liked on Spotify. And I think there's something, there's, there's just something really amazing about that. And I've been speaking to like a few different communities about how you, you can just, you can, because like you can see everything on Etherscan, which is sort of like the public ledger of everyone's wallets and what's in there, you can do really interesting creative things about kind of like enabling fans of of similar enabling fans of like similar projects and stuff like this. And something I don't know if you're familiar with Colors, the the they're they're doing a DAO. And this past weekend they like did this mint for their like founding NFTs and they gave people from Friends with Benefits Water and Music, this other DAO, Song Camp, and I think Seed Club, all things we've talked about, which is great. They they gave them early access to the NFT. And that's just something you would not, like all of that information was so heavily gated. It, it still is so heavily gated on, on Web2 platforms. And I think that, I'm like I, that's like a huge part that I think is really exciting. Yeah, I, I definitely want to want to want to go into this direction. So how how can um, these um, Web three um, ideas, concepts, technologies change um, the relationship between like artist or like producer and recipient? On, on one hand, I mean, we, we had, um, or oh, 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 let's put it this way. What, what are um, more examples? Like, um, okay, we, we can, it could imagine like an NFT, for instance, but we could also imagine, for instance, like a, um, a tokenized artist or something. Are there any uh, good examples? Um, so, that, so that would basically um, really change the relationship that you as an artist have with your fan base. So your fan base would be more like your stake or shareholders so uh, are there any ideas in the um, um it exists and it's not already? necessarily a utopian idea <laughs> or like a, a, it, it it exists there's things called social tokens that had a moment where the idea is that you could issue tokens in relation to your practice as an artist or something like that. You can think of examples where it might work. Uh, you can also think of examples where it could turn into an absolute nightmare. Um, in a sense, over the past couple of years, I think, and I'd, I'd give caution to people. Because there's been so much money flying around, a lot of people are jumping into Web3. A lot of people jump into Web3 with really good ideas with solid communities, and a lot of people jump into Web3 like spotting a, an opportunity and then kind of over-promising. And so there's definitely been scenarios where people are like, hey, you all own tokens in me now. And they're, you know, you don't, you don't, like, you don't want your favorite band to have, you know, 100,000 people voting on what their next song should be, right? Like, this kind of defeats the purpose of it. But that being said, the idea of giving uh, supporters some upside in or some way to participate in the growth of your project it could be very nice, right? And I'm, 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 I'm describing the same tool from a positive and negative uh, uh, direction. So it's really about that. It's kind of like what you're describing with, like, the voting or, or DAOs just generally. Like, I can think of really positive examples. I can think of heinous examples I wouldn't recommend to anyone. And it's somewhere about calibrating, like, cautiously dipping your toe in. I think, again, it's yeah, it, it's really a... 
about the like human element and like knowing what people you have people have to know what they're getting into like I actually I remember like early days of the of your podcast actually on your patreon page it was you were very explicit and it was it was very like uh like straightforward wording but you were saying like you're funding our studio you're not like funding the podcast and you're going to get to choose the guests like that the, the creative control is still ours but like you're 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 contributing to this like wider like studio concept and like I think that that's I think that that's a really important part that you don't you don't kind of like open the doors to your doubt and you're like you can contribute you can build a tech stack you can release a record it you have to kind of I think be very explicit and and from like an artist perspective if you want to you know, start a tokenized fan club and give people uh, access to, you know, early merch drops. Or I, I think this is a very like early web two thing where people used to, I think like it, it's the concept of bands in town where you could like, pe artists would route their tours based on where they knew. And like, I think there's actually a really cool way to like probably do that, mm -hmm. kind of bring that idea back through, through blockchain. But like, I, I think you need to be very explicit with your fans. Like, you're not going to like choose what songs are on my next album. Um, and I, I think that's like the human element of it. Well, the, re the real danger of things going wrong is because you have so many options, mm. which is kind of a good problem to have in many ways, right? There's nobody necessarily determining how you use these recipes. That being said, public education on this stuff is still really poor, sadly, and I don't think that the press does a great job uh, <laughs> helping that situation, if I'm, if I'm absolutely honest. Um, and so, yeah, so it, it's exactly that. It's like, don't overcommit things. Like, everybody needs to kind of learn. But the, the reason that some things do go wrong is ultimately because there's, it is the Wild West, um, and, and that there's pros and cons to that. Um, Master, do you, do you want to uh, add? Or? Well, well it's, it's, it's still early. There are no best practices, and then you have to think the stuff through. And, uh, and I think but, but, but what, what we see now here in discussion, I think, is what some, some, some of the fundamentalistic critic of this web free stuff is that it's all f turning everything into financialization. And I think what we're seeing here is that's not true. It's, 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 uh, it's your choice how you set it up as an artist or as a band or, 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 or whatever, and you have to think it through what you want. And, and, and well, what, what, what end result you're going to get with the setup you're choosing. Yeah, on, on, on the financialization thing, I actually wrote a piece last week specifically on this where as someone who's been working within independent music for the best part of 20 years, like there's always been financialization. <laughs> It's just we haven't been able to see it. And I was describing this as like the shock of the nude, right? There's nothing new about these dynamics. It's just now they're on open ledgers. And so people are like, oh no, it's so stratified. It's like, yeah, always was. Like, but actually having access to that information, maybe you can configure things to, to address that problem um, rather than living in pretend land, which, which Web2 often yeah, is a very deceptive place. Um, before um, I, I want to um, enter into a um, uh, final dreaming um, round, uh, so to speak, I... I mean, I, I said um, in the very beginning that, of course, I, I'd be always be interested because this this is a very important aspect of the whole discussion: sustainability. Um, so, how how badly do we need um, like blockchain technology to reach um, some of the goals that we just described? This would be super interest. Uh, I would be super interested in. Um, maybe we can also do a little uh, round here. If, You wanna? I, I think it's obviously very helpful, but not entirely necessary. Like, I think that uh, because DAOs are so buzzy, there's a lot of people literally just putting the acronym at the end of their name to get funding and attention. Like, I think 100%. And like, if you don't already have the community or the good idea, it's, in my opinion, going to fall apart whether you're on a blockchain or not. If you have a good idea and you're interested in, in kind of... Uh, dispersing that idea, decentralizing that idea. It, blockchains can help with decision making. It can they can help with like, you know, kind of redistributing equity back to the back to the people who make it valuable. But I think you were uh, I mean, I don't know the so many of the specifics around uh like German organizations, but you were speaking about one that is similar to code. But like I think actually DAOs are more similar to like Varines, like social clubs actually. And like Kashmir Radio is a Varine. Um and it's they have like this Vorstand and these these sort of like annual meetings and actually like I mean Kashmir definitely should not be a DAO, but like they could, they, they have the ex almost a very, very similar social model to something like Refraction. One is just making use of blockchain technology, one isn't. And I think that that's okay, you know? Um. 
Like an analog DAO. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Marcel, what, what do you think? Um, so what, what is, where do we need um, blockchain well, technology? Well, there's, uh, there's certainly in, in some aspects a lot of hype around this topic. But like I said, uh, with blockchains, we for the first time I see a technical remedy to the monopolies we have. And maybe there are going to be other technical remedies, what, 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 technical solutions we can build on, but I haven't seen them yet. And uh, but um, but I would also say that the way we see blockchains now is, I mean, we all, we already know when, when you when you're talking about the climate uh, aspect, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be proof of work; it can prove of stake or can 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 be based on other me mechanisms. And uh, and uh, I think even we can uh, think about how can blockchains. Uh, work differently. We don't have to be based on mining and and speculation around that. We can be based on on, on you can you can build a public blockchain that's run by a cooperative of many entities that are just running different nodes, uh, similar to what Facebook wanted to do with, with, with Libra. So you can build even a blockchain where you, can, where you take the speculation aspect out of it. And what I think is most important about this aspect is what I tried to say earlier about the history of, of uh, Web 2.0 APIs and, and NFTs. And what I see is with NFTs is that we are getting an API standard that is getting built up, bottom up. And that's the only way we're going to get it. It's not like Apple and Spotify are going to sit on a table together and, and, and design together on, on, on a music streaming API that the services can build on top. And even if, if they would, we wouldn't get what we're getting now. What we're getting now, what, what's getting built now is, is far better because it has the variety we need. Matt? Yeah, this question comes up a lot. It's often presented as a gotcha, and I think it's a very complicated question. Um, I don't think, so my position ultimately is why not use a blockchain? Um, and I say that I say that because I think that the environmental concern is largely overblown. And um, we could talk about that for a long time, but I think it is actually very frequently misrepresented, um, particularly in, in contrast to something like, let's say, the fashion industry, which is like yeah. unbelievably it's, more it's, pernicious. It's part of the narrative now. Yeah, yeah, it, it, but we, I could address that, but, but, but more specifically, you know, what blockchain? Um, yeah. Right? Like, it's Web3 crypto is presented as this monolith. There are very, very different proposals there that all have very, very different governance mechanisms, very, very different backgrounds, various levels of centralization and decentralization. Um, but, but most importantly, when I bring up things like a song camp or a nouns or uh, some of the projects that I'm involved with, like there's also a degree of like practicality. Technically, I could accomplish anything that I'm trying to accomplish with pieces of paper, right? But then things like overheads come to play and time and busyness. So you have to ask yourself, rather than like, does this need to happen on a blockchain? In some cases, I think there, it does actually. In some cases, I think there's very specific technical reasons why it does. But in other cases, it's like, would it happen without a blockchain? And another part of that, on top of that, is too, and I, you know, I, I'll be maybe the baddie here and say like, I think sometimes we throw proof of work under the bus a bit too quickly because it's an easy thing to say, right? Say, oh no, well, Ethereum has a plan within the next two years that I believe that they will execute to, to reduce uh, energy consumption by 99.9%, which would be 99.9% of 0.01% of global emissions or something like this, right? Um, cool. But proof of work has its place too. There's actually going to be, once that happens, you're going to hear the progressive case for proof of work uh, emerge. And I think it's kind of the same, um, uh, I think it's kind of the same for, uh, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, where was I going? Where was I going? Um, it's kind of the same for this kind of like, do you need a blockchain thing? Mm -hmm. Where you're like, actually, like, once you remove the stigma, that's been elevated from a very particular direction, then why wouldn't you experiment? In actuality, like as you mentioned, right, yeah. this whole composability principle or the forkability principle, that why wouldn't you want to start a cultural organization on an open public database where there's currently like tens of thousands of people building software for you? Like, why wouldn't you want to do that, right? And this is coming from, again, you mentioned Web 2, right? Web 3 has a, has a similar utopian story. Right? Web 2, originally, the utopian idea was open APIs. Like, let's see what happened with that. What, what failed with that, right? One of the failures that people don't like to necessarily talk about is a failure of, like, a monetization system for open source development, right? That people, like, struggling to do this stuff in a very virtuous way, right? But ultimately, you know, like, running, running, uh, running core dependencies of the internet being unpaid. 
Crypto kind of solved that problem, and that's why you saw a lot of people defect from, let's say, traditional open source and embrace crypto of saying, well, actually, now we can, in some cases, like IPO before we even have a product, which is kind of a problem. But in other cases, there's some way to, to share this come through. And so for me, too, there are ideas that I think are cresting now that will end up becoming big cultural conversations similar to that time. CC0, Creative Commons. Right, actually, the vanguard of the NFT world and the vanguard of the crypto world, they're all in on that. These are people who are like all in on it. all media ought to be free and media ought to be expensive. Everyone ought to be compensated. We ought to have provenance for everything. We don't want to gatekeep anything. We want media to be out and we're going to build business models on top of that to make it feasible, right? Like what I describe as like a feasible abundance. These are progressive ideas that failed in Web2, largely because we hadn't figured out some of the monetization uh, things. And the big part of that too, also to kind of be a baddie, is that I think speculation gets thrown under the bus too. Right? Maybe one of the things we've learned, which is a really bitter pill to swallow, is that yes, the speculative components of this have also speed run, or like, you know, we've speed run like whole new economies because there was this other incentive mechanism there. And let's not pretend that the early internet part of it wasn't funded by pornography and gambling too, right? This is always being complicated, right? But I think many of those core ideas that killed kind of maybe the utopian promise of Web 2 about open APIs, you know, creative commons, all this kind of stuff, I think we're kind of making nudges toward that. Um, and so when that comes into place, I say, well, yeah, I don't think that those things are anywhere near as feasible. I could write down how you could technically do it on Mastodon or whatever. Mastodon, which has, what, a million euro a year budget or something like this for allegedly a competitor to Twitter and Facebook. I mean, this is absurd. No, that, that's not going to be practically how it works. Blockchains have actually practically presented a, com a competitor, and we know that it's working because Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Instagram, Spotify, who had this opportunity in 2015 when they acquired Media Chain and didn't do anything with their ideas about media provenance on, on chain, right? All of them now are being like, oh yeah, maybe in the future, you know, we were just at TED, for example, and it's like the head of Instagram was there being like, you know, maybe we should be an open protocol, and uh, you know, you should own your audience, guys. Like, and it's like, these are ideas that were radical, these were protest ideas from people in, in 2015, that all of a sudden, uh, Facebook and Instagram are, are the, which signals to me that they feel that they need to compete yeah. with what's coming. Now, none of these other alternatives, as beautiful as they may have been presented, got to that point. So let's not throw blockchains under the bus, uh, you know, let's, let's give, them, give, them, give them their credit. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good point. I, I, I encourage everyone to look, uh, to, to watch this TED Talk by, by, by Adam Mosseri, the Instagram chief. Very surreal. Uh, it's very a, surreal. And, yeah, yes, but, but also very interesting. And I, because I think uh, integration of NFTs and into these mainstream services are going to jumpstart this whole thing even more. And I think this points to another thing that I, that I strongly believe is going to happen. That's, that is not like, Web 3 or Web 2.0 versus right. I think it's end. I think it's right. additive. Yeah. Yep, you're right. It's also my feeling. So we got five more minutes. So can we do this little dreaming uh, round? Like everybody just does like a little of dreaming how a perfect uh, music Web 3 uh, would could look like from your point of view. Uh, would you like to start? I mean, I think what you both were just saying about like the additive Web 2, Web 3, I think like. Uh, a lot of my friends come to me and they're like, what, so I should like delete my Spotify, release everything as NFTs? And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what this is. I think like there's ways to explore. Like, I, I just think that it's about exploring both avenues. And I think that like Web2 really privileges uh, like lean back uh, listenership audiences. And I think at least right now, Web3 is really privileging, like lean in, like you need to watch a ton of YouTube videos to set up your wallet and mint your thing. To, to and, yeah, but I think it's really like fun. I'm I'm really enjoying it. And I think like when you, uh, when I see the projects that I'm most excited about, it is all of these people who are just like nerds, to be honest, and who are like really excited. And I think that that's in a way like, uh, I, but I, I, so I think that like, uh, you know, Web 2 is very like frictionless and Web 3 still right now is filled with tons of friction. But I think that that attracts different people. And I think that that's cool. I think that you I, I, I would hope that we could we could have both. Very nice. Uh, Marcel? <laughs> uh, dreaming. Um, well, I would just I would just reference Kevin Kelly's 1002 fans from, I think, I don't know, should have done my research, 2007, eight, something like that. As with you as an artist, you just need 1,000 true fans and you can, on the internet and you can make a living. And I think the stuff we're talking here about is making it more feasible for artists, even at, at, at a smaller scale 
to make a living. And I mean, that, what, what more do you, do you need to dream about? Yeah, wonderful. Matt? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I touched on this earlier. It, fundamentally, again, like, the, the whole reason I was initially interested in this space was in opposition to this idea of a one-size-fits-all. So really, the dream scenario is that anyone who's strongly opinionated about how they want their practice to work or their community to work uh, get involved in the space and demonstrate how how we ought to do it, right? That, that's kind of the dream, and I think that, that that's happening uh, steadily. Um, there is also the other side, which is, I think, a kind of nightmare scenario where, not to sound too speculative or kind of whatever, but we're in dream state here. Um, I think that these ideas of, of ownership, provenance, um, having a stake in where we're going in the future, I think that they're very, very important. And I think in some cases, you know, there is this kind of attempt, which is really difficult. I understand it. It's like if you've grown up with Web2, you believe that that's how the internet should look. Um, there's, there's these arguments, like skew, skeuomorphic arguments that we need. Oh, yeah, we just make streaming, but involve tokens. It's like, yeah, sure. Like, you don't need that, right? Actually, with the, the infrastructure that's being built right now, I would challenge people to think, like, where's the internet going to be in 20 years, and how do you make yourself more resilient to that? Right? I would never promise, in essence, that crypto tools are going to make everyone loaded and happy. It's, I think it's quite the opposite. I think the crypto tools are like a way for people to gain some purchase over what might be coming. Um, and when you look at, for example, Meta's plans, this kind of idea of, of the metaverse, they're not doing that casually. Like, it's very easy to glibly to dismiss uh, what's being done. They're not, they're not doing that casually. I think that, you know, I also do a lot of work in, in machine learning. This stuff is like, it's not science fiction anymore, right? This is science like now. And, and the, uh, you know, having principles of, let's say, artists owning a share in what they contribute to or audiences being able to work directly with artists to, to help grow institutions or something like this, I think it's, it's actually a bit more grave than people are, are now aware of. I think that it's, it's a very fundamentally important thing to care about. Um, and I haven't, seen as good, you know, I, I haven't seen a better place to be able to experiment with that than crypto. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I don't know how you feel, but um, I, I'm um, super um, um, happy with um, that kind of dreams that have been developed um, here and um, also like um, um, possible threats or risks that we um, identified. But I'm um, very glad that it was not like a pure, okay, how do we monetize our music uh, kind of talk. But um, yeah. That was the idea of dreaming. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, Marcel, Caitlin. Wonderful um, to have you tonight. And um, please come with us downstairs and have drinks and uh, keep on talking. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.